Hello, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Juanpe, and I am a consultant uh, working in Berlin. And one of the topics that preoccupies me a lot is how to modernize uh, C++ code bases, especially code bases working around interactive software using value semantics and value-oriented design and functional programming. Um, but oftentimes, we are presented with code bases that are uh, written in a style that is a little bit antithetical to some of the values of value-oriented design, which is object-oriented programming. Um, hence, this talk is titled after the impossibility of squaring the, sim the circle. Is there any way in which we can resolve these differences and solve the impedance mismatch between values and objects? The first part of this talk is called circles and squares. We're going to talk about squares. These are objects. We're going to talk about circles. These are values. Now, I think that values are correctly represented by circles because at the limit, when we zoom out, the circle is just a point. A point is kind of adimensional. A point can represent maybe an abstract idea because values are like platonic ideals. They are like mathematical objects. In this sense, they are purely abstract. They are immaterial. They are necessary, eternal, and immutable. They live in our minds. They don't really live in any physical world, not even in a computer, really. In a computer, we put values in objects. And objects, they are boxes. They have a dimension, and they occupy time and space. In this sense, they are concrete, material, contingent. They are temporary. They are mutable. Now, values are particularly useful as mathematical objects precisely because they simplify reasoning. Um, but a value in itself, as a point floating in this adimensional space, it doesn't mean anything. We attribute meaning to values by creating relationships between values. Once we have a few values related to each other, we can maybe start understanding that this two is somehow different from a three, and that by using another relationship, which could be a value in itself, in this case, the plus operation, we put it in relationship with a third value, the number five. There are programming languages, actually, that try to operate at this very abstract level. And in Haskell, we can name values directly. And these names somehow are eventually resolved, and we call this basically computing. Now, we work in a different programming language than Haskell. We work in C++. And in C++, we may have instructions, uh, statements like this one, int foo equals 42. Now, here, we're not giving the number 42 a name. We're giving an object in memory the name foo. This object is allocated in memory automatically for us, right? Um, but we're creating a box in memory that has the name foo. Inside this box, then, we put the number 42. This distinction is important. We can actually identify this box by taking its pointer value, which, of course, we can assign into a different box associated to the pointer itself. And we can use this identity value to mutate the box. Right? So boxes can change their contents over time and be associated to different values. So the fundamental thing that we name in C++ and in construction that we use to program are objects, which are this combination of allocation, allocation in memory, plus a type that restricts the kinds of values that we can put inside the box, plus a lifetime that tells us when this box is, value, is valid and allocated somewhere in memory. Now, the philosopher Wittgenstein said that the limits of my language are the limits of my world. This, I think, can be explained in our programming world or explains a phenomena that I'd like to describe object fetishism, which means that when all you can name is an object, everything looks like an object. And we start seeing the world through object lenses instead of abstracting them maybe as value types. I'm going to give you an example of how this object fetishism can be manifest in practice. Let's say I'm writing a program where and designing some data types to represent rooms that live in a house. So I have a vector of rooms. Um, and these rooms have, let's say, a light that can be toggled and some name. Now, these are simple value types in C++, right? Intuitively, we can talk about value types here without defining them more. We can copy them, and the semantics of these things are um, 
interpreted through the values that are stored in them. But let's say we want to add doors to our program. A door can be thought of as just a connection between two rooms. So a C++ developer would say, well, easy. I just have a pointer between to the rooms that the door is connecting to. This is problematic. Well, the first thing that is problematic here is that these pointers are pointing into the vector, and we know that the vector is going to invalidate the pointers as soon as we change it. So we should instead put every room now in their separate box to make sure the identities are stable. Now, to avoid leaking pointers in the doors vector, maybe we should keep track somehow with shared pointers and weak pointers of when are the doors alive. Now, I think, though, that this is problematic because we were talking about rooms and doors, and now we're talking about memory pointers, about objects in memory. This is outside of the problem that we're trying to solve here. I think we can solve this problem more elegantly by giving rooms an explicit identity value that is separate from the pointer value of the object in which they may be stored or not. Once we do this, we can keep doors uh, simply as you know, the identity of the rooms themselves that they represent. Now, in this case, the identity might be just the position of the room in the vector, but we could also give them an explicit identity and store it in an unordered map. And once we use values um, as our fundamental um, abstraction, we are separating the representation a little bit from, uh, from the concept that we're trying to represent. So we can use more fancy data structure to store the doors. And we can use different data types. We can be playful with it, because now we're not tied to, oh, I need to have my objects in memory in a specific way just so I can reference them in other parts. Now, in C++, though, we can actually seemingly move between the two ways of thinking. So even if I am using the value-based representation, I can still write functions that are a little bit objective in the sense that I'm receiving here a reference and I'm mutating the object in place. So I have here you know, an object that contains a house and I turn on the light and it's doing the mutation in place. But I can grab this in a function that takes by value and returns by value and the passing by value copies that are done in and out change this function into something that is just representing a relationship between the input and the output. So in a way, we can think of there are two different houses that somehow has the state related to each other. Now, you may be thinking that passing by value in that way, data structures that contains vectors and whatnot, is very expensive. Um, that doesn't need to be the case. And actually, at Mus in Moscow this year, I did another talk about postmodern immutable data structures that kind of should settle the question of is passing by value expensive or not? So I'm going to work under the assumption here that actually passing by value doesn't need to be expensive, and I'm going to do that very often in this talk, um, just to say. Now, I may criticize often object-oriented programming, but there is one topic, though, where it seems that object-oriented programming is often quite good, which is modularity. What I'm talking about here? Uh, let's go back to our example where we had our house represented in an objective way. So everything is in a share pointer and living in their own uh, space. And I'm going to add here a boost signal that allows me to listen to when is the light state changing uh, in a room. This signal theorem is an instance of the uh, observer pattern. It just means that you can connect to this object passing a lambda, and this lambda, is big, or this function in general, is going to be evaluated whenever uh, the light changes. Once we do this, this is uh, quite traditional, I would say, object-oriented design. We can write a room component that builds a UI for my room, where I have, I receive a shared pointer of the room we want to control with this UI. We connect to the signal in the button that is emitted when the button is clicked and change, update the state of uh, the room, notifying other potential listeners. And then we have the update in the other direction. So whenever the state of the light is changed, I update you know, the text of the button in this case. 
So this is a typical two-way binding pattern that we use in object-oriented UIs all the time. And this has one advantage, which is that um, this is quite modular. So the share pointer here is actually decoupling the lifetime of the room component from the lifetime of the rooms themselves, which is an advantage. This, the observer patterns is decoupling uh, the notification from um, when the changes occur from who is listening to what. And, you know, I can put the rooms in a house, but this doesn't need to know that the rooms are in a house or anyways. I can reuse this component actually in different kinds of applications using rooms somehow. So once I instantiate a house, I can instantiate a room component. And as soon as I click the button, the state of the light changes in place automatically, right? These hidden dependencies, they're useful to achieve this modularity goal, but they are also problematic. Because as, as our application grows, we start you know, having drafts that are bigger and bigger of objects. And we end up, maybe this, this doesn't have that many objects, but I think it could be a realistic use case taken from a normal application. And if a programmer of the component A tries to make a call on the component B, this programmer really, they cannot make any assertion on, or any assumption or what is the, uh, the state of the object gonna be after, after calling this method. Because we see here that there is a callback to the root and this callback to the root may call any other function as the notifications are propagating or whatever, uh, making actually reasoning about the state of the program very hard. And hence, we often find weird bugs you know, infinite recursion loops between notifications. We see partial states in our, in our UIs. This is complicated. So using value-oriented design, we would like to replace the representation of our data model to a single value. Our data model becomes a value instead of an object graph. This value we want to put in one big box. And ideally, we only have one big box with all the data model of the application. This is what is called often uh, this is a term I borrowed from Clojure, the single atom architecture. Now, once we implement this, this architecture, we face the problem of, let's say, the value is representing the house we've been working with. Whenever I update, I want to update the house, I have to somehow, whenever, for example, I want to turn on the light, I need to somehow learn how to produce a whole new house, just to be able to turn on the light, with the state updated, that I can then put back into the box. There are architectures, though, that work around the assumption of this single atom architecture. There is one very popular one, which is the unidirectional data flow architecture that is actually quite often used uh, in the web world for making UIs on the browser using technologies like Redux or Elm. And I'd like also to introduce the library Lagger, which is a C++ library I wrote to support the unidirectional data flow architecture. Here, we write components or modules that are separated between actions, models, and views. This may sound familiar to you. It looks a little bit similar to the model view controller architecture, but it's different in that the boxes here, they don't really represent objects, and the arrows, they don't represent associations or pointers references. The boxes here, they represent values, and the arrows, they represent transformations. So in this architecture, I have an update function that receives an action that happens in the world, represented as a value, the current state of the world represented as a model value, and returns a new model value with the state updated. Then this is passed to another device, like a render function, that ideally is able to produce a view value associated to this. If we don't have something like React JS in the web world, um, this can be a little bit inefficient, so instead in mute, um, immediate mode UI libraries like in GUI are actually often useful and you have a function called draw in these cases. Uh, and, uh, finally, you need a way to introduce actions into the system. You do that with some kind of dispatch method. Now, I don't want to talk a lot about this architecture today. There is another talk I did last year at CPPCon called the Most Valuable Values where I cover in depth how to implement applications using this architecture. This architecture actually solves the modularity problem for single atom architectures, uh, insofar 
we program all our application in modules that are divided into three components. Now, in the beginning of the 20th century, we had following you know, the modernist ideals and rationalist ideas to build new societies, um, we had lots of architectural and urbanism projects around uh, the idea of utopian urbanis urbanism. So there were city designs built in this time that looked perfectly regular, like this vertical city by Hilbert Simon, or uh, Le Corbusier's Radiant City with perfectly aligned boxes. You know, they look like um, the designs that a software consultant would love to produce uh, for the architecture of a system. I love particularly this one, the Garden City by Howard, because this is clearly following value-oriented design, right? It's all circles and connections. Um, the truth, though, is that cities where people actually live in, they have been, go they have been around for millennia, right? This is a map of the city of Rome, which is like, I don't know, 4,000 years old. And it has evolved over years and years, and these patterns that it shows are not always perfectly functional and are not always you know, perfectly aligned. I think the code bases in which we C++ developers live are often more like this, in the sense that they are old code bases, evolved maybe for 20, 30 years. I've definitely worked in code bases as long as that or even older than that. Um, that show, you know, the in intersection of the many paradigms that have been applied through all that time. The problem with the unidirectional data flow architecture that I just showed is that, as I said, if you're starting from scratch right now, I would say go watch that talk and use that. Um, but if you are working on a different code base and you still would like to evolve it to integrate more value semantics in it, then let's continue with this talk and let's talk about code source. So our goal here is to achieve a single atom architecture, right? Let's then think how first do we implement this atom, right? This atom has to be an abstraction of an object. And an abstraction of an object can be composed of these three uh, simple methods. One, to get the current value that is stored in the box. Another one, to set a new value in the box. And a third one, because we're writing interactive sy systems, to watch the values in the box. So whenever it changes, it notifies. Now here there is already something important. The watcher receives two arguments. This is why, uh, because I want to receive the old value and the new value. This is very useful when writing UIs to study what they change between the two values so I can do an efficient update of my UI. Now, to implement this box, first, we're going to put the information in a node that lives in a shared pointer. Why? This is our central store. We say we want to live in a single atom architecture. So we're going to actually, and this might be counterintuitive, we want to share this with everyone somehow. Once we do this, then the implementation of get, set, and watch is just, you know, updating the value that we have in this box that lives in a share pointer and notifying when things change. Let's use this central store now to re-implement the room component. This is the room component we had before in the object-oriented way. Now, this is still the room component using an object-oriented API for the widgets, but using our central store with our value type house. Now, as we said, we now need to be aware of the house. We need to be able to produce a new house whenever anything changes, because that's the only store we have. So the room component needs to receive this house state, and then it needs to receive an identification of which room uh, is controlling, is being controlled by this component. Then again, we uh, listen to when is the button clicked. Whenever it's clicked, we get the current house out of the box, we update it, we put the updated value inside the box. Whenever we need to read what the current state is, we do that through the rooms vector and the identifier that we have passed to our component. 
Now, this works. We now have a single atom, but this makes me sad, right? Um, this makes me sad because um, the room component is not modular anymore. Why is the room component concerned with houses? Why does the room component need to know how to traverse uh, the house to get to the room it wants? Let's look for solutions to this problem. And I'm going to introduce here an abstraction that comes from the functional programming world, which is called lenses. And they are often called functional references because precisely they try to serve the purpose that references use in the object-oriented world. A lens, what it allows us to do is to say, I have a data structure representing something big, like the house, and through the lens, we can look at part of the state. For example, the switch on state of the light of a particular room of the house. Now, what's interesting about these lenses is that they work in the two directions. So they allow us to get a view of what is happening, um, get the current value of this part of the thing, for example, the switch on state. But it also allows us to produce a new state of the house with the updated state when we want it. Let's look how this looks in practice. Using this lens now, we can change the room component such that we don't know anymore where does the room live. Right? What does the central state contain? We don't know. So we make this a template. The state has something. Now, we don't receive anymore an index to get to the room. We receive a lens that could be anything that is the tool we're going to use to get to the information we want inside the T. Now, whenever we want to get the current state of the light on, we use this function view where we pass the big state potentially the house, the lens, and we get the information we want. Then we use this put function where we pass the big thing, for example, the house, we pass the lens, we pass the updated state of the piece of information we want to put in the state, and returns an updated version that we can now put in the store. Finally, again, we can use this view function anywhere where we want to consult what is the current state. Um, to implement these lenses, um, there is a naive implementation of lenses, which is the most useful to understand what the concept really is. There are more advanced implementations that I will reference to later. In a lens, fundamentally, it's just the combination of a getter and a setter, right? A getter to implement the view function, a setter to implement the, the put function. The getter, you pass it the whole, basically the big thing, and it returns the part we're interested in. The setter, again, you pass it the whole, you pass it a part, and it returns a new whole with the part updated. The view and put functions I mentioned, they just will forward in this naive implementation to these things. With this now, we can implement a lens that allows us to get from the house to the switch on state of a particular room, right? You can have this function that you give it a room ID, and it goes in the getter through the rooms ID, uh, sorry, through the rooms of the house to get the light on, and on the setter, it will set a new one and return the new house. We can now use this with the room component we just defined in the previous slide to use a central state and have different components referencing different lights and having some sense of modularity. Now, ideally, I don't want to have to implement lenses manually that way, but use a family of combinators where, you know, I say the first one is just an attribute access. So add access the attribute through the room uh, member. The second one is just accessing an index in a vector. Use a function for that. The third step is accessing, again, an attribute. And combining this, using some kind of piping operator. Now, there is a non-naive <laughs> implementation of lenses called Varlahoven lenses that actually they are composable to the extent that um, you can use normal function composition to define this piping operator. 
because the length is defined as one single function that takes a function as an argument and returns another function as a result. It's a little bit complicated. If you're interested in this, read these two papers. You can also check the implementation in my library, actually, which uses this representation for lenses. What's interesting is that even though we're using a very abstract way of accessing things, it sounds like we're almost really designing the language and redesigning the dot operator. Um, the compiler sees through the abstraction we're creating because I'm not really using STD function in the real implementation. I'm using you know, lambdas, generic lambdas that are statically compiled and statically assembled, and the compiler sees through it. So we go through you know, this, compo this composition of, len of lenses to update a thing and then get the new state. The compiler sees through it. It was just a constant to begin with. Now, this definition of the room component is still not satisfying. The first reason is we have here a template, and I don't want to have to recompile every UI component in my program whenever I change part of the data model, which I will have to do with this. The second one here is we're watching the central state, which means that whenever anything changes in my application, all the UI components will try to recompute their state. This is also not efficient and not satisfying. Can we go further? And I think so. Let's extend the API of the state by adding a new method that I'm going to call zoom. It's called zoom because you pass a lens to it. And it returns something called cursor that has the type of the thing you're zooming towards. Now, this cursor has the same API than the state. So you can operate with it as if you had a central state, but you're operating only on the part you are interested in. Now, cursors are, and this is pseudocode, you can check the implementation, which is a little bit more complicated in practice, but um, cursors basically eventually are assembled for, uh, following a directed graph in which they end up referencing the central state, but they use some forms of caching when propagating notifications down there. So in the end, things do not update all the time whenever something changes. And it leverages you know, the things, the parts of the tree that didn't change, change are not propagated through the cursors. The other thing very important that this is doing is a form of type erasure. Because when I'm talking of a cursor of bool, right, I don't need to know if this bool comes from a house or from somewhere else. So finally, I can write my room component using the cursor. Takes a cursor of bool. Whenever we click the button, we just get the state of the bool set the new one, and when we're watching for changes, we're getting just the state of what we're interested in, which is the bool, and we're finally happy. This is a very reusable component that actually <laughs> it doesn't even talk about rooms, actually it just talks about a Boolean flag that could come from anywhere, really. It is when instantiated this component where we specify where this information is coming from, and we do so by saying, well, I have the state, my central box, and I pass to it a lens to zoom into the information I'm interested in. This is actually equivalent to using the zoom method multiple times, at least um, uh, from a um, uh, semantic point of view. Of course, the performance implications are a little bit different. Um, there is one improvement we could do here, though, because if I have a pointer to member, I'm pretty sure the lens I want to apply is one that uses the pointer to memory. I, I shouldn't need to always write utter there. If I have a vector and an index, the thing I want to do is to access through the uh, square brackets operator. So the lenses library also provides what I call magic lens operator, where basically, normally for the data type you have, when you pass it an index, it tries to you know, do the sensible thing with it. So the final code of passing the information we want to the root component looks just like this. Now, what we achieved with this is that we have our central state, our single atom, which is 
the central source of truth of the state of the application. Then we have a family of cursors, which are views that take part of the value stored there and project them. And then finally, we have the views that are talking to the cursors to query this information. We still have a bunch of boxes here, but the nice thing is that whenever something changes, the information flows and changes in the central thing that then is propagated back following a full circle. There are all no way, like no intertwingled like callback listeners, setters happening in different parts and in different objects. There's always one central abstraction where everything is going through every change of the system. The other obvious advantage is that um, writing concurrent code is now easy because at any level of the hierarchy, I can get a copy of the value, send it to another thread, operate, then return it back, set it through, the, through a cursor at that level of the hierarchy. Another advantage, performance-wise, is that you may argue that a cursor is a little bit more expensive, uh, more heavy than, let's say, a queue property or something like that. But the advantage here is that you only need as many cursors active in your application as views you have visible in your application, right? Because the cursors are only used to channel the data. The data really lives in a very simple value type, which is just a structs, vec vectors, and things that are very fast and easy to traverse and that have very little overhead. The overhead is added, of course, per view component uh, that is active. Um, so there is a library, uh, I will link to it later, where I implement this cursor abstraction. This cursor abstraction is actually split between reader and writer. Because in the same way that we have const objects uh, that you, know, you can only read, maybe you want to have components that can only read and watch information. In our application, as just suggested, we have then state components that we use at the root of our data graph. We can also use sensors, which instead of storing the information, they use a function to query it whenever you commit it. And finally, we use different kinds of transformations to um, derive new cursors out of the ones that we have at hand. There is, um, well, some of the interesting things we can achieve with this also is doing, for example, also cross-thread communication. We assumed everything here was single-threaded, uh, which it is by default in the implementation, but now that we control how a state lives separate from the information and the values, we could have a cursor that says, well, actually this cursor is written from one thread on one end and is read from another thread on the other end and uses for cross-thread communication. Um, but another thing you can do with cursors is to transform them in a different way, other than lenses. Because when we have a box with values, well, with a value at a given time, when we consider the box as a function over time, it becomes a discrete sequence of values. Now, we have lots of tools uh, in C++ for transforming discrete sequence of values. Now we're going to get the ranges library. And if you're used to doing functional programming, you're used to functions like filter, where you say, well, I'm actually not interested in the odd values of the sequence. Remove them. So it would be interesting to be able to do this and get another box that doesn't have those values, doesn't notify them, never shows them. I can also use this, for example, to change, of course, the type of the thing in there. I could also use a lens for this, though. Now, it would be, though, quite tedious for me to implement all these functions just for this library. There is fortunately an, abstract, an abstraction called transducer um, that allows you to express transformation over push-based sequences. This is sequences that happen over time, um, as well as sequences that happen pool-based sequences sequences that are already there. Now, the ranges library is, is excellent for pool-based sequences, but doesn't scale to push-based sequences. Transducers, in this case, do. I don't have enough time now to talk about transducers in depth, but if you're interested in the topic, you can check um, this talk from CppCon 2015, Transducers from Closure to C++. And it shows, again, how functional programming, I think, can often be translated to C++ quite correctly. So, 
I'd like to finally show you one example of a real-world application, or realistic application, let's say, um, that tries to use this library to achieve this purpose. Um, this, let me see. Great. So I've written here an application that is the typical to do MVC, right? If you've done UIs for the web and you're compar comparing web frameworks, you always have an application written that is a to do list. So I can add here items like give talk, do laundry, and this is actually not a web page, it, so I can actually access files from disk. And I can have here, <laughs> you know, add things. I think the talk is now on the way to being done. And maybe, I don't know, this I will postpone to when I'm back to Berlin. Um, now, <laughs> um, don't use this. <laughs> um, how do I, oops, this version. How do I write this application? Um, so I got this application using Qt. And Qt, you know, is an object-oriented framework. I use, in particular, uh, QML, which is a technology that Qt uses uh, that allows you to write the UI in a very declarative way. So it's actually a programming language that is a JavaScript superset designed to write in UIs. What's interesting about it is that you can write expressions, like, for example, if I have a to-do item, I can bind the color or the text to um, this property model is the to-do item done, um, and say, well, depending on whether it's done or not, we show mark or mark as text. And I don't have to connect uh, signals for the button text to be updated. It's done under the hood by the framework. Now, this looks declarative, but it's not functional. It's not value-oriented, because all these things are backed up by stateful objects. Uh, so this to-do item could be implemented by a class like this, uh, where we have the DOM flag stored as a member of the object, and we use this very, a little bit raw syntax Q property to define, well, what is the setter for this property, what is the setter, the getter, the setter, and the notification signal, right? Um, of course, this doesn't lead to a single atom architecture because eventually in your program you have like a million properties distributed about a million objects related to each other. What I want to do instead, of course, is to have a value-based model where the model is just a struct, uh, where I have maybe a name for the document, I have the vector of to-dos, and then each to-do item is simply the flag and the text. There is no notification mechanism, no signal slots. Everything is a copyable value. Once it's a copyable value, I can actually implement my application logic or business logic, however you want to call it, as simple functions that take a model and return a new model. These functions, they're very easy to test. They live outside of any kind of framework. They're great. They can be executed in another thread if you want, you know, passing by value and returning by value. Um, they have lots of advantages. You don't even need any advanced C++ feature, like a newbie C++ developer can also write these functions. Of course, they have the advantage that there is no way to bind a UI to this. We need now to somehow write the Q objects. So what we're gonna do when writing our Q objects is for every property that we wanted to expose to Qt, we're gonna use a cursor. So we're gonna have the DOM property, uh, that is the bool state, is the to-do item DOM, which is gonna be represented by a cursor. Then we have the text. The text, interestingly, was an STD string, but here we need a Q string, because to expose text to Qt, we need to use Q strings. Now I can implement the Q properties in a very extremely systematic way. The getter just gets from the cursor, the setter just sets into the cursor, and of course we need somehow the signal. Same for the other property. Now the interesting part is gonna happen in the constructor. What do we want in the constructor? Well, in the constructor, we want a cursor to the value type we're interested in for the whole type, right? Which in this case is gonna be the to-do item. Now, in the constructor, we're gonna feed the cursors using the lenses that we showed before. So we say, well, the DOM property 
you can actually get it from the data using the DOM attribute. Then the text, you can get it also through the text attribute. But actually, we also need to convert the type in the two directions for the getter and the setter. So in this case, we're going to use the transducer API to map the std string to a string. Finally, we need to watch the cursors such that the queue signals emit whenever the underlying data changes. This was very boilerplate code. Most of it could be generated by a macro. So this is how actually the code looks in the end. We use this lagger QT macro that expands to a cursor plus the associated uh, getter, setter, signal, and creates the connection of the signal to you. So the only thing we have to do here, really, is in the constructor to say how are these cursors fed from some source of data. Once we have the item, now we need the model, right? The thing that contains all the to-do items. Since this is already the root of our graph, of, of our data graph, or our data tree, here we can already put the state. Uh, so I put a state uh, with the model, our value-based model, and I pass also automatic tag. Automatic tag um, means whenever any cursor does a set, propagate the changes automatically. If I don't put this, it will wait until you do a commit, which is actually often useful uh, to make sure states are propagated once they are consistent, let's say, at the end of an input handler or at the end of a UI frame. But in this case, the application is simple. Automatic is enough. Um, I define more cursors, one for exposing the name of the document, another one for exposing how many elements are, how many to-do items I have. I connect, again, the cursors to the state, defining how the information flows. And interestingly, this function, uh, it's a queue invocable. It allows the QML code to fetch the to-do item at a given index. Of course, we need to construct the item passing the cursor that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, we are already more or less familiar to the syntax for the lenses. What's interesting here is that we just return a new item doing no memory management. Why? When this queue invocable is called by QML, this object is going to be garbage collected by QML. Even if we were writing a traditional Qt application, we should be doing some memory management here because the identity of the item will be associated to the identity of the thing it's representing. But here, the queue object is just a view. The real data is in the store. So it doesn't matter which, uh, which to-do item we're returning. We just return a new one uh, whenever you need one. Uh, finally, of course, we need to implement the operations to add a queue item, remove, to save, to load, using the simple functions that we uh, did before. Maybe an interesting function here that I didn't describe before is this update function um, that is also part of the cursor API. Um, the update function is basically a getter and a setter combined. So you pass it a lambda that receives a value, in this case a model value, and returns a new model value, and um, it stores uh, an updated value in the box using this function. Sometimes it's more convenient to use get and set. Sometimes it's more convenient to use update. I think this was a big achievement. Because we managed to really like just write an application that looks really dumb from my, its data model. It uses really simple data model information. And we managed to somehow make it observable and write a UI against it using even an object-oriented design. So this leads us to the conclusion. We saw this new abstraction called cursors, or I mean new. It's not new outside of the C++ world, actually. In Clojure and JavaScript, there are other libraries doing similar things. Um, that on the one hand, it resolves the impedance mismatch between value-based data models and object-oriented UI. So, we saw this clearly in this example where we had a value-based data model and we managed to somehow adapt it to 
write a UI in an object-oriented way against it. Another use case for this is also for an incremental redesign of an object-oriented data model to a value-oriented data model. Because if you already have your data model expressed as a tree of objects, you can incrementally start at the leaves of your system, adding state variables to replace the properties that you already have. You probably have some property abstraction in your system with a listener and um, some data. You use the state variables there, and then at every step of your refactoring, you bring your state objects one step up in your hierarchy using cursors in the nodes that have been already transformed. Eventually, if you put enough time into this, you can get to the root of your system and have all of your application written in a value-oriented way. Now, this library is not science fiction. As I said, I work as a consultant with various companies, and particularly Prenav and Capella, they're using this library Lager that has the Cursos library in it. Um, Prenav, in concretely, is using actually uh, mostly a unidirectional data flow architecture. It's using the Redux part of the library, uh, but they're also using the Cursos in some places. Capella has a UI written in QML, where this is being quite advantageous. Uh, these other two companies, Omicron and Ableton, they are not using the library, uh, but Omicron, I wrote a library specifically for them actually a year ago that is using basically the principles uh, that we saw today, even though that library is proprietary software and it's in their code base. Um, and a lot of these concepts actually developed almost now like four or five years ago uh, inside Ableton, where we're working in some experimental projects on how can we, could we write music software in a simpler way than the technologies we have today. I also would like to thank these two people, Kurt Busse, who has been helping me a lot uh, these days in cleaning up the transducer library, and Maria Carrasco, who also helped me write a text editor using the uh, Lager library that is part of the example code uh, that is linked from the repository. Also, interestingly, <laughs> there is this person, Tony Van Erd, um, his uh, friend that I've met at a few conferences right now, um, and we seem to have our brains connected somehow because <laughs> three years ago, at the same time without talking to each other, we, we submitted a talk to C++ Now with the title Postmodern Something. This year, we have the two of us submitted a talk that has almost the same title, Value-Oriented Programming in an Object-Oriented World. Um, he did this talk at um, uh, CppCon this year. So if you're interested on a different take on some of these issues, um, in his case, he's not focusing so much on the library aspects of cursors that I showed, but more on the general uh, philosophy uh, of integrating values in an object-oriented world. Uh, it might be an interesting talk for you to see if you like the context here. Um, finally, I would like to leave with a quote from uh, a thinker that I really like, a writer and thinker, Eduardo Galeano, because when I've talked about a lot about value-oriented design about, and functional programming to C++ developers, and most of the time the answer is, this looks great, but that's an utopian vision. I'm working in a real-world system. I cannot use this as work. Thanks for the info. Goodbye. <laughs> but I think utopias, these utopian visions, they are still useful. Eduardo Galeano used this definition of utopia. utopia is on the horizon. I move two steps closer, and it moves two steps away. I walk another 10 steps, and the horizon runs 10 steps further away. As much as I may walk, I will never reach it. So what's the point of utopia, then? That's the point, to keep walking. Thank you very much. So there are some questions. We still have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. It mm -hmm. was very uh, nice that each talk of yours is a, a lot different and we don't have to like the same material every time. It's something new, it's, it's great. You're very productive. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, the question is, uh, you said during your talk that uh, it may seem that you are reinventing the dot operator in C++. So mm -hmm. we just can, if you had only reading, not no writing, we could just like say model dot uh, lamp and pass it to the function, and it's everybody using here. And it also and it makes us like a lens, which is 
read-only lens. Yeah. So here, your uh, um, this uh, cursor uh, thing may, makes us write, um, enables us to write in that model. But uh, when uh, I'm talking about writing and about uh, parallel development, uh, uh, you can easily write something through the lens, which will get uh, that into the model, which will be inconsistent with some other write done by some other lens. So the object will be uh, mutated from two different places and it will get into some inconsistent state, uh, which is uh, a little bit like what we had before. So how can this be handled? Um, so, well, first, like the, the lens, through the lens, you get the value, you update it and then set a new one, right? So you're always doing the update on a state that is consi consistent. What is true that maybe could happen is that if I start doing things like I watch the lens, right? Uh, sorry, I watch the cursor. And in the watcher, I say, well, depending on the new state, then I set something then you get maybe into some kind of trouble. So you should never use setters in watchers of lenses. If you want to change two things, um, you should do that in a function, actually, in, in a value, just a simple function uh, that establishes all the invariants you want in the data. The nice thing is that, um, as said, at any level of the hierarchy, you can just get the whole thing and set a new whole thing. So if you have invariants that um, that are associated to multiple parts of the data, don't split that data simply and get that data, operate on it, and set all that data together. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for this uh, great talk in which you connected a lot of different ideas. And I would like to proceed with the same question I had it in mind. Can we please return to 34 uh, slide? Uh, I'm not quite satisfied by the answer. And we can discuss it more. Uh, can we please return to 44 slide? Sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the question after we return to the 44 slide. Can we do it? Oh, the 24th slide. Yeah, 24. 44. 24, you said? 44. 44. Four and four. Yeah, that was this one. Or yes, this one. Uh, no, no, previous one. This is the next one. Yeah. yeah. In this scheme, you said that you can uh, essentially the same uh, question as my colleague said. You said that you can you know, work with your uh, state over the cursors in parallel, in main, namely in concurrently, and you, we have two. Uh, different uh, threads here, mm -hmm. and when we go into a single point of uh, committing to the state, we will have a, um, uh, a we could have a conflict in between these two threads when we do a mutation. And my question is, how this cursor's uh, idea is connected to software transactional memory? Mm -hmm. Because it seems very similar to it. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's true that you should not be operating on cursors for multiple threads. What this allows you is that if you want to do a transformation um, that is, for example, a computation that is very expensive, I can, sadly, the, on this screen, the, so I, I can, let's say, take the data outside of this cursor, send it to another thread, and when I'm done, set it here, right? Um, this will not be possible in an object-oriented way simply because I cannot copy it. I will have to send a reference and then I will have to lock the access to the object somehow because I'm not, I cannot copy the data. Here I can just take the data out, copy it, send it, and when I'm done, set it back. Of course, there are potential applications like what if another thread is also interested in, in changing the data that is in this box, right? So, uh, but that's a logical problem more than a, more than a programming pro problem in the sense that you're doing maybe two concurrent um, editing on, on the same part of, of the data. Um, but the model supports that. So here, the, the transactional aspect comes not from the fact that, like in transactional memory, 
that is a way to undo operations because this is not an operational procedural model. Here, the transactional aspect comes from the fact that at any level of the hierarchy, you can do set and get. So if I have a transaction that affects the whole application, I can get here and set here. And all the changes that I did outside are not seen, right? The things are seen once I do set in the box again to set the updated value. I don't know if this is clear enough, but uh, I hope it is. More questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, uh, things that are not so easily represented at uh, abstract values. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, like a socket or something. Uh, uh, do you have anything to say about it? Uh, how would I uh, represent it as a circle? Mm -hmm. uh, um. Maybe you just don't. <laughs> so uh, it is true that this is talking here. Um, I'm focusing on one particular kinds of applications, which is interactive software. And I'm focusing on what we can call the data model, right? which is the document, the representation of the user's mental model inside the software. Um, supporting this, you may have multiple object-oriented systems that are somehow feeding data in and out of the system, like a socket and whatnot. But these are uh, operating necessarily outside of the functional world. Particularly a socket needs to send information to the internet. So it needs to perform side effects. This enters some kind of conflict uh, with, uh, uh, with a purely functional programming thing. Right? You need some way of performing side effects here. Um, the library actually, even when, it, when you have this action model um, view separation as values that I showed before, it actually has some tool called effects to have some kind of communication between the stateful systems that you have, like the sockets, and the part of the system that is inside the value world. Uh, that's described in the documentation if you're interested in it. Um, but yeah, not everything, not every part of the application should live here. And I mean, this is part of the reason why this library exists, precisely to allow those parts of the system co to communicate with uh, uh, the parts that should be uh, just data. Yeah. Any other question? I think there was another one over there. Maybe? No, no. Uh, yeah, I have a question about this picture again. Mm -hmm. So uh, would it be correct to say that main difference between this picture and your model and uh, more classical object-oriented designs that you mentioned in the very beginning with lots of uh, implicit relations and lots of connectivity is that in this case, you first force a tree hierarchy between uh, boxes, and inside each box, you can either uh, not modify it, or you can modify it whole, uh, its state as a whole, as opposed to modifying a single tiny bit in object-oriented design, and that forces you to think about, uh, well, about object as a whole. So is that like important idea of this design? Uh, yeah, I, I, I will agree. I think that, yeah, this design encourages you thinking of the data as something separate from the behaviors, actually, and thinking of the data as something holistic uh, as a whole, as you say, um, instead of something that can be so much split in parts. Now, at the same time, and this was why we built all this whole abstraction, uh, you still want to be able to somehow focus on parts of the data without talking about the whole. And this is what this core source abstraction in particular allow you to do, to interface with things that sometimes are want to only talk about part of the data. But you're still being explicit about how the data is distributed, right? Because at some point, you're passing the lens. And this lens, I mean, the ones I pass are very simple, but actually this lens could also do invariant checking when propagating the data back into the bigger object. Um, at some point, yeah, there is some clear path of how the data is being propagated because it comes from a central place down to the leaves. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just to clarify, so uh, here it's, it's uh, uh, the important property of cursors as opposed to, for example, references is that you cannot just go and change random data. You have to ask uh, like the parent cursor to change it for you. So you're not missing any changes. So 
is, um, it important, is it important difference between cursors and references? Yes, but the thing is that's done under the hood for the, by the framework, so you're still working as if you had a reference, but you still have control over how the data is inter integrated in the whole, yeah, because it's not mutating an object directly, it's sending the data somewhere, and this sending then can be customized, and uh, you have control of it. 